So I was taking a look through my spooky season plans and I realized I don't have any Cthulhu mythos on there. So I said, let's head on down to Miskatonic University and uh, raise a glass to Mr. Howard Phillips Lovecraft. Hey, what's up, bookworms and deep ones? Mike back today to talk a little Lovecraft as we're getting back into the Cthulhu mythos, something that we haven't done since this time last year. Now, guys, look, uh, Lovecraft is something that I cut my teeth on as a young adult. Uh, I got in when I first got into Stephen King and I said, I want to explore more horror besides Mr. King. The first thing I did was Lovecraft and then, of course, Mr. Poe. But uh, yeah, this is obviously something that's going to be very, very important to me because, it, like I said, it's kind of where I began with it all and pretty much began this romance that I have with horror. Now, I've talked on this channel before about my experience discovering Lovecraft and why I think that you should read it, why I think it's still very important that you read, even though these are almost 100 years old at this point. Much like Conan, I think it's something that you can appreciate even now and see how influential it's been to this entire genre. But uh, I want to kind of talk about my top 10 Lovecraft stories here. Now, I did some reviews last year for Fright Fest, but I said, you know, instead of just doing more reviews for individual stories, how about I, I, people love to do a, a nice little ranking thing. You know, they, 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 really, they really do love that here on the booktube. So I said, how about I go through my 10 favorite Lovecraft stories in preference order. So I am going to be ranking these and kind of talk about why I think that maybe you should read them, give you a quick little synopsis of what they're about, kind of give you a little tease. But I'm still going to remain spoiler free on this because I want you to experience these stories. And if I tell you about the big greasy monster at the end, I don't know necessarily you want to read about them. So I think discovering them on your own right is a great way to do it. Guys, the thing about Lovecraft stuff is, yeah, you can spend money on the collections and the leather bound stuff like I did. Or, you know what, these are all public domain at this point. You can just Google and read these for free if you really, really want to. I see all the time digital sales for these things for his entire works for 99 cents. So I think these are really easy to access, but still I'll drop a link below if you want to kind of check out some things in a physical format like I do. So let's get right into it. You are safe from the tentacles here because this will be spoiler free, but let's start with a nice little honorable mention before we get going. That The honorable mention I'm going to go with is the case of Charles Dexter Ward. Now, look, this is his only true novel. It's something that, you know, it kind of started as a short story and it kind of grew to a novel. And uh, I think that's why I'm going to disclude it here because I think the best Lovecraft is his short stories because they really get to the point, they get you right in your face, and then they get you when they reach up with the tentacles and they grab you and they pull you under, right? So that's why I, I think this one kind of falls outside that, but I still think it's very, very good. Plays on necromancy and black magic and, of course, big scary monsters, but it kind of deals with the investigation of an escaped mental patient and digging into the past of his family history, and it doesn't go quite the, th the way that you like. So uh, I say check that one out if you've got a little extra time, it's going to take a little longer to read than the rest of these. I think that uh, much like uh, Robert E. Howard, like I said, these are low commitment. They're all like 20 or 30 pages with the ex exception of something like At the Mouth of Madness, Out the Mountains of Madness that are a little longer and things like that. But we'll get into that as we go through it. So again, low maintenance. You don't really have to spend a ton of time. You don't have to dedicate yourself to reading these. They're really, really quick. So I'm going to get into it now. Number 10, I have Dagon. This is one of his earliest works. And I think it's a good way to dive into Lovecraft's writing style. You know, something I, I say a lot with like a Tolkien or like a Poe or like a Robert E. Howard is sometimes that prose might be a little tough for you to grab when you realize that people don't talk the way that they talked 100 plus years ago, you know? So it, it's a good introduction, I think, and a good introduction to his world as this deals with, uh, you know, someone like me that is terrified of the ocean. I think that this is a great, great story if you're wanting to be a, a little creeped out. It'll make your skin crawl a little bit if you're scared of the ocean like I am. But it explores the idea of, of uh, you know, humanity being insignificant in the greater matter of things due to, you know, the size of some of these creatures that are in the sea. And you think about it, our own ocean is, it's every bit as unexplored as outer space is for us, really, you know, because we can't go too deep because of the pressure. So when we start talking about the deep ones and stuff, and we will continue to talk about deep ones as this list goes on. Uh, but I think there's a really good introduction to Dagon and seeing that there are entities that worship this other entity 
and not just humans, you know. So uh, Prince presents a lot of good ideas, gets a really uh, good introduction to the scale of his monsters and, and, and things like that. So a uh, very good introduction, I think. Again, it is one of his earliest ones, so don't look too much into, hey, he does improve over the course of his writing. But I think it's a good way to you know get your toes wet by dipping them into the ocean there with Dagon. Number nine, I have the Whisper in Darkness. Uh, I think I like this one a lot because it's the first introduction, uh, first introduction of Migo, and Migo is a character that ends up being uh, a very very important. We learn about the other ones. You know, you got the deep ones, you got the other ones, you got the elders, you got all kinds of things in this mythos in this shared universe that he put together. But when you learn about the uh, the, uh, the the outer ones, this is where you start to learn. Oh, these aren't all you know from our planet. These are all you know from other planets and things like that. These are from uh, outer space. You know, outer. Haha. I, I think it works really, really well. But you start to see that okay, there's this big, big epic story for all of these these big monsters he's got. It isn't just a new monster of the week who just you know crawled up out of the ocean. The ocean's the easy place to go to. But with this, you can see they do go outside of our own planet and they go to others. But uh, I like that this one really ties into the Cthulhu mythos. And uh, with, with humans worshiping some of these these entities and things like that. But this one gets really, really out there with the space travel. And I think it's so charming to go back to, you know, stuff well before we actually did travel to outer space as a species and seeing how fascinated everyone was with it and uh, how just pipe dream it kind of felt like to them. So they had to kind of think of new ways to do that. But this one, it really, really goes crazy with some of that it has to do with like brain removal it's really really crazy guys i definitely say check it out number eight i have the lurking fear i think with the lurking fear uh what i like about it it's it's, uh, it's it's like investigating these rumors of like a monster attack and a whole town like disappearing this is something i think that he uses kind of a lot in his stories and i think it's always a really good hook right but uh with the they, they check out this mansion in this town and it's empty they spend the night and then, uh, the, then the, he, our protagonist wakes up and his companions are gone. And we got to kind of figure out what happened. I think this one's one of his true horror stories because there is no Cthulhu mythos in this. There is no big greasy monster. This one is all straight man-made horror. And I think that it will show you that this guy is more than just you know the scary monsters, the sci-fi elements. This guy could write just a killer horror story and this is one of the better ones he has several like this uh but you know he does a, a really uh creepy kind of haunted mansion as well as anybody out there and this one has one hell of a surprising ending it has a like i think like four different viewpoints in this one but the ending is something that kept me guessing to the end and i was way way wrong and i think it's a very satisfying ending if not one that'll make you say Wow, he went there. So uh, definitely one of my favorites. I probably would be higher, except, uh, you know, when I make this list, I looked at it and I was like, I feel like this list will change in about 10 minutes. So let's just kind of go with it. That's where I put it. Number seven, I have uh, sh The Shadow Out of Time. And I, I feel like a lot of people are like, wow, I haven't heard of a lot of these. Because the thing with, with Lovecraft, you got to realize is they haven't made a lot of movies of his stuff. And I think that's why you have an, uh, an author like a, a Stephen King or, 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 or something like that, to where you know them based off of those movie adaptations. Uh, they've only made a few movie adaptations of Lovecraft works, and you really have to dig deep for some of the ones who haven't really broke big into the pop culture yet, like a Cthulhu or, or Mountains of Madness or Inzima, things like that. Uh, ones that I'm sure you'll come up on this list, but right now we're talking about Shadow out of time and this is the introduction of the yith or the great race i think and it really messes with telepathy and mind swapping in this one and that's always going to be something that's kind of fun to play with one of those that makes you question what is really happening and what is not what is all in our character's head and uh that's a, a theme that i think he would play with quite a bit but never better i think than in this one our main character has no memory of the last five years and he starts to dig and what he finds is rather horrifying obviously so this one's kind of told in that non-linear fashion and it slowly uncovers things to you know shocking revelations and these are very very vague guys because i don't want to spoil what they are when they're just you know 20 page stories it's hard to kind of talk about them without exactly talking about what made them really great to me but just know that these 10 i would recommend that you read at any time, any place, anywhere. You don't need to know anything about Mr. Lovecraft's uh, universe at all to enjoy each one of these stories. Uh, these are just the ones I think, once I've read it all, 
as a whole. Once I read this whole bad boy here and I tried to put some kind of linear fashion into it, some kind of timeline order, I looked at them and said, these are the ones that really stuck out to me. E even if it's just because it's building onto something else, I think that these are the reasons that I have them on here. Number six, uh, I did a full review of this one last year for Fright Fest. This is Shadow Over Innsmouth. And if you want to check out that review, uh, you can find it right here. Uh, like I said, I did, like, I think, three of those last year. So that's why I said, hey, I'm doing spooky season. I don't have any Lovecraft. I got to think of something now. Sh Shadow Over Innsmouth. Uh, this is the best story, I think, with the deep ones. You know, we kind of touch on some of the things that were visited in Dagon. But again, I am always going to be partial to those ones based off the ocean because, well, to me, it is scary as shit. You know, what might be down there kind of thing. And with this, you get to see what is down there, and that makes it kind of scary. I think anytime you got like a stranger goes to town and starts to experience really crazy things, that's always a fun trope to play with. And in this one, this tourist comes to town, he starts to notice things are a little fishy about Innsmouth and it starts to lead him down a path that I think he wishes he could go back and never ever experience. It kind of ties back into Dagon and the cult that is worshiping him and other things. It explores those themes of, of greed and if you can put a, a monetary value on human life, you know. And this one, it just has a really bone chilling ending that's just gonna really really stick with you until the very end i think it's one that i still think about constantly and especially this ending because it's a real real shocker i think number five here guys we got the dunwich horror and this is another one i think has that name recognition just about everyone has heard of this if they're interested in horror whatsoever even if they have not read it this is also another one i did for fright fest so check out that review if you want a full breakdown of what makes this story really really memorable but i feel like uh, like I said, this is one that most casuals have heard of because uh, it's about a young child who you know is born deformed, has uh, a, a kind of increased intelligence though. Uh, you know, he's reading and writing far far earlier than he should be. Uh, he kind of develops into adulthood way earlier, but this leads the town to freak out and shun him and his family. And this is when the family notices, or sorry, the uh, the townsfolk uh, start noticing about this family is that they keep uh, buying up cattle, but yet their herd doesn't seem to get any bigger. So uh, there starts to be lots of missing cattle and things like that. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, this leads us to the Necronomicon, which is actually the first appearance in his universe, I believe won't be the last. But things get really, really bananas by the end when you realize what this family is housing within their walls because they keep changing, uh, they keep upgrading their house to house something really, really massive I think and it's a it's a character that would be recurring in his universe and it's a very big introduction to him here but yeah just at the end I think that you're just your jaw is going to be left open by just the crazy chaos and pandemonium that happens at the end of this one very very fun very very cool story that I think everyone is going to enjoy uh, as long as you don't mind something really really freaky here number four and this was any one of these four here could be my number one honestly because they're easily my four favorites uh, but this one I got the rats in the walls uh, if you're scared of rats this one's going to get to you uh, like I think of that uh, that adaptation of 1922 that uh, Netflix did of Stephen King from Full Dark No Stars and I think it took a lot of influence with this with the, with the rats always scratching at the walls kind of thing but uh, this is a, a man is he kind of inherits an abandoned uh, a, a state from a family member starts to hear some scratching sounds on the wall gets a companion decides they're going to go down through the basement and check out what's going on right stop if you've heard this one you know i feel like this has been done a million times but there they find some big big things and i'll just say that this is a uh, this is one of those and you find like some ancient underdwellings and much more but uh he finds out some real real fucked up things about his family history it's one of those kind of things where you got to realize hey sometimes curiosity does more than just kill the cat it uh it can lead to some dire dire consequences and this one man is just a head trip i think it's another one of those where are questioning if this is really happening or not if it actually ever happened in the first place uh if our characters actually were we thought they were does that make a lot of sense i don't know guys check it out this is a definitely one of those uh i i think is very uh poe inspired in that it's a uh, is that dis descent into madness and trying to decipher what's real and what's not when things are really really coming to nut cutting time number three guys i i don't think that this is a shocker that anyone has heard of this uh call of cthulhu uh, this is without a doubt his most famous creation is Cthulhu. And it's amazing that a creature that's just so terrifying 
is it has been made into such a, a little cutesy amount of, uh, of toys and stuff and plush animals and cute little stickers and t-shirts and things like that it's amazing that this big scary monster is the one who's gotten like the uh the the kawaii treatment i guess you call it it's really really weird but i mean it's it's not only this most popular story this is the one that kind of begins his shared universe as a whole seeing where it all began here much different narrative in this one it's like a, a collected works almost like a, a bram stoker's dracula or something like that but here's where we learn about the great ones for the first time and of course uh Relia. i think it's pronounced Relia. that's uh, the, uh, the the island where cthulhu resides uh examines cult worship of the monsters uh, willingly by humans but more about the the horrors that the human mind can handle you know especially in regards to their place in the universe and feeling so insignificant next to these monstrous beings, you know, and and realizing that, uh, you know, hey, they were here long before we were even a thought on this planet. So uh, that's when you get into your, your ancient ones and things like that. So very, very exciting stuff. I mean, I, what can I say about Call of Cthulhu that hasn't been said? That's why I haven't even reviewed it on the channel because I feel like everyone, even if they're not really big Lovecraft fans, if they're into horror, they've read this one and they've reviewed it on the tube. So I haven't actually gotten in deep to it. I wouldn't mind doing this one like i said i just feel like it's kind of been overdone to death i don't know if there's anything i can say about it that i haven't already and it would just be me trying to say uh that famous little uh, catchphrase from this story which is not easy to say but uh i hey i would do it for you guys if you want me to uh number two uh this was a tough tough choice uh between number one and number two this one at the mountains of madness i, I think if there's anything that is prime for a true Hollywood adaptation, it would be this story. I think it's the one that is easily the most easily uh, adapted, I think, in that it feels very, very cinematic. And I, I think that um, probably his most famous work after Cthulhu, I think for sure everyone's kind of heard of that. I know for a long time, uh, Gilman de Toro wanted to make this, but Hollywood insisted that he shove a love story into it. And he's like, that's not what Lovecraft's about, man. And so it just, it just never really materialized. So good for him for sticking to his guns on that one. But introduced to the Elder Ones, obviously. And he just continues to build that world. And I like what this one is. Instead of uh, you know space exploration, we're talking about like, Arctic exploration, places where humans probably shouldn't go because, you know, the body temperatures, they can't handle things like that. So uh, I, I love that idea of replacing space with, you know, parts of our planet that we can't explore because of the temperatures. Great, great idea. So I like that he doesn't just do space, he doesn't just do the ocean, now he's doing the Arctic, all these places we can't go. And it quite makes us questions of how far should man, you know, how much should he let his curiosity lead him to these places? So Antarctic exploration or explorations and going where maybe man shouldn't go. Uh, they do find an ancient civilization and fossils, and this encourages them to keep going. So uh, some real revelations for the universe as a whole. But look, guys, with this one, the body count is super high in this one. I think this probably has the highest body count of any of his books. I don't know, because you do have, uh, you know, mega events but just like as far as like the cast having like individual slayings i think this might be the biggest one so uh i love it i love it to death i think it's a great great story i did reread it last year before fright fest because i did do that full review right here for it at length because i think it's a great great story to uh, to, to dive into and i think it's a great place to start with uh with, with lovecraft if you want because it isn't just a short story. This one's like 100 pages, and so it's going to be a little longer. So if you're looking for more of a developed cast and a little bit more diving into Miskatonic University and things like that, I, I think you'll get it here. It's It's got some good setup and some good payoff for sure. So uh, it's really the only reason that it isn't number one on this list is because number one for me has always been the color out of space. And this was the first review that I ever did for Lovecraft on this channel, right when that movie came out. Uh, I decided I was going to talk about it and talk about the uh, the book. Now about those old videos, guys. Look, uh, the channel was a lot different back then. You know, uh, <laughs> I didn't have the sound equipment. I didn't have the audio equipment. I didn't have the video equipment stuff that I have now. But you know what? The ideas that I talk about them, those feelings haven't changed at all. I think this is an amazing story, and I just think that uh, it's always been the Lovecraft story that is stuck in my head more than any other. The idea of like something of maybe extraterrestrial origin crashing on our planet and having these effects on people that are well you'll see you'll see and uh, i think it's uh it's it's something that's been kind of done a lot uh, you know over time i mean i think of how influential this story was i mean i think about like the tommy knockers you think about uh, the andromeda strain lots of things that have dealt with this alien object crashing on earth and giving adverse effects to the humans 
And I think with this, um, probably just the most nightmarish body horror story in all of his library. I mean, the idea of when is that family member is no longer the person that you loved and it is now the thing that killed it, you know, and how far would you go to, uh, to, to put those people out of their suffering kind of thing. So just ultimate fear of the unknown story, which is what he was the best at, has this humongous sense of dread, wanting to know what is in that well kind of thing. Really, really good. It's just been copied and or parodied for so many years now and just an awesome awesome blend of his sci-fi and his or uh, horror origins so guys that is my top 10 again i think any one of these uh someone could say is their favorite lovecraft story and i would not disagree and guys the thing is i probably could have done 20 of these but i'm trying to keep this video you know to the usual 20 minutes so uh those were my 10 guys have you read any of these do you want to read any of these are there any that you feel like I should have put on here. I think there are some, but that's a conversation I'm always willing to have. I'm always willing to talk a little Lovecraft in the comments below. So drop in the comments, guys. Tell me your top 10 and said something why mine suck. I think that's the best way to go about this. But I do know this is the internet and these things are going to happen. So, hey, I will talk to you there.